so sequestering more, and finally to include everybody and every place along uh, Europe. That would be uh, our main uh, goal. And within this, we will try to explain that how agroforestry, as a, as one of the of the agroecology initiatives, could fit within this green deal purpose, and uh, how by economy through the development of different products from the goody perennials, but also from the herbaceous vegetation, could foster and help farmers to adopt. Uh, agroecology practices in concrete agroforestry practices uh, leading the transformation from conventional to more sustainable land use systems across uh, Europe. Uh, the, even, the event uh, will be structured with uh, a set of talks. We will hear, well, I will start making a common general framework it will be followed by the explanation of silvopastoralism and biodiversity pre preservation for, by, done by Professor Anastasia Pantera. Nuria Ferrero will speak about forest grazing, a way to, to mitigate climate change with very interesting results where we can see that grazing is not a problem. That is some, sometimes it could be, it is a, a solution for the mitigation of climate change. Marina Castro, Professor Marina Castro from uh, uh, Portugal, will speak about operational groups and agroforestry in northern Pro Pro of Portugal, linking this aspect of uh, all people, all places should be linked to the Green uh, Deal uh, through the explanation of an important and interesting um, network created through the funds of um, created through the funds. Uh, of the European Network for Rural Development, meaning the, the operational groups that will keep doing uh, the same during the next uh, CAP period, the post-2020 period. Alexander Wessel, Professor Alexander Wessel, who is um, the uh, project coordinator of agroecology uh, for Europe, uh, a very important and relevant uh, project because it will set up the basis to uh, to create the new uh, agroecology partnership. That his uh, presentation will be entitled Agroecology, Agroforestry and the Living Labs uh, Promotion. We finally hear uh, another uh, European Union uh, project leader, Professor uh, Philip Grandman, who will explain a bit about alternative business development for grasslands that could be seen as a basis for other type of bioeconomy development uh, in both uh, good vegetation and herbaceous uh, vegetation. And we will end the, the, the meeting with uh, your participation, which is key uh, during this event, in a big uh, uh, round uh, table. From an operative point of view, I just want also to announce that uh, we will provide certificates at the end of uh, of this uh, event, with those that partici really participated in the in the during the during the event, uh, in the for forthcoming days, they will receive what you will receive as you indicated. So the certification that you were present in this uh, in this event. So thank you very much uh, indeed again for being uh, here and share with us these uh, these ideas and this. Uh, yeah, perspectives about how the, uh, the the Green Deal of the Europe, that European Union programmed for by for all of us could be linked and association associated and promoted by the agroforestry and uh, bioeconomy. We will end more or less at uh, 11 or 11 o'clock. So thank you, thank you again very very much. Well, I will share my screen. Uh, right now. So I'm Maria Rosa Mosquera Lozada. I'm full professor of the University of Santiago de, de Compostela. Um, the talk I will present is about agroforest extent and green deal policy uh, framework. Well, the agroforestry, uh, the, the green deal and the connection of agroforestry uh, to, to the green deal should be based in the, uh, on the green deal premises. 
which is related with the economic growth, with the no net emissions by 2050 of any of the activities, uh, industrial activities that take place uh, in, 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 Euro, in Europe by 2050, but also to not left be, uh, not left in, lefting behind no, uh, lefting behind nobody uh, or not place across Europe because moving the green deal uh, should should be should be based on the on all of us on the promotion and the link of 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 all of us to towards the uh, use of 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 the land well, with regard to the economic growth, I will start to define agroforestry because this is a term that is not easy for a lot of people. And uh, I will provide a, a definition that is funded in the, in the FAO event, uh, in the FAO definition, and that was adopted by the European Commission. So for a concrete climate and soil, uh, an agroforestry system is a combination of a good perennial, which, which could be tree or a shrub with a crop or grass that is produced uh, in the under story of this goody perennial. And if we have grass, then we can have a third component, which is the livestock. There are complex systems because uh, they have to have, and they are semi-natural systems because there, are, there is a key factor, a fourth element, which is the man that has to yeah, manage the, the the different components of agroforestry in different, uh, just thinking on the interactions that are produced among them. This means that if uh, someone makes, a, a, I don't know, a thinning, it means an increase of the herbaceous production and probably an increase of livestock and all of, um, and maybe also damage to the tree. So all of this has to be taken into account at the same time. The main aspect that the, initially the man has to, to, that man has to uh, work with is the light, which is decided by the density and the good perennial distribution at the beginning of the establishment, and also the reduction of, uh, of, of the tree density through, through thinnings along the life of the tree. Because, yeah, the trees grow up and the conditions that for the Gander story are modified. Well, what is the advantage of agroforestry uh, towards the Green Deal? Well, the main advantage is from an economic point of view is that farmers' income is increased. And this is because there are multiple products from land. We have the tree, the timber, the bioeconomy, or any kind of alternative product that we can produce, and also the under story. Well, if we have more, more crops produced for the same unit of land, meaning that we use better the resources that are available, like light and, and nutrients, then we will have more money. That, that's something that is at least intuitive from our place, our point of view. The second advantage is from our economic point of view is that agroforest is able to extend the growing se season just through the crops and the grasslands. Here we have an example in, that was produced in, a, in a, it's based in Italy, where we can see that during the winter time, the tree has no leaves, so pasture it can be used by animals. And during the summer time, the trees have leaves with high level of protein content, as far as 24, this is Morus, Morus uh, alba. And this means that during the summer time, where no grassland is available, then uh, we have an alternative product to feed our animals, and therefore, with a high co uh, protein content, and therefore the, uh, avoiding or to avoid the, the use of, of concentrates to feed uh, animals in Europe. Another way of seeing this is through the transdermitans or the transhumans, which is a movement from the lowlands to the highlands where uh, forest grazing can be, uh, can be used. Well, what about the Green Deal? the second pillar of the Green Deal, which is not net, net emissions. Agroforestry is recognized by the, the United Nations and the FAO and also the European Union as an excellent tool or one of the most uh, promising tools to mitigate climate change, mainly because it's able to increase uh, carbon sequestration. Here we see the most important um, agroforestry system in Europe, which is the DEGESA, and we can see that below the tree, the carbon up to one meter, meter depth is a 50 
uh, stored in the soil. The soil is the most important component for the storing of, of, of carbon, just because it represents 85% of the carbon of the terrestrial ecosystems, in spite that nowadays the countries cannot recognize this value for the uh, from uh, for the IPCC uh, fulfill, uh, fulfillment rules fulfillment. So below the tree we have 50. We are far away from the tree, meaning 15 meters from the trunk. Then the the amount of carbon is reduced at the at, at, uh, by half. So this, uh, this shows us, I mean, the, the high importance of having good perennials in, in, in plants from a mitigation point of view. But also because in some areas, like for example, the south of Europe, the great grazing reduces the forest uh, fires risk because we avoid having this uh, vegetation, which is the fuel that finally uh, is fired and, and make the fire to, work, to, to develop very fast. If a fire is established here, you can imagine that it will not reach the, the canopy of the tree, so it, it will not affect the, the, the tree. But on the other hand, if, if it, the, the, the weather conditions are so bad, I mean, the, the, the fireman can stop it easily. If all the understories like this, we have a problem. And a problem that is very important in the south of Europe, where in three years ago, 100 people died in two days due to extensive uh, fires that uh, that was happening in forest without uh, taking care of the understory. But also agroforestry, and even it's not so related with, uh, it's not one of the pillars or principles mentioned in the Green Deal, I mean, if it is in the, in the background, it's adaptation. We can expand the, and extend the growing season. Below, below the tree, we can see that there is vegetation that can are of quality for feeding animals during the summer in the Dehesa. But if the tall trees are available, then this adaptation is not produced. But also because we, show, we saw in some experiments that extreme heat impact is reduced with agroforestry due to the shade of the trees. And at the same time, due to the, 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 the shade, the animal species are, more, are less able to be developed and pesticide needs are, are reduced, which is also important from a quality ecosystem services provision point of view of our agroecolog agroecological systems. But also we need to, to know about that uh, the, the third pillar, no person no, or place is left behind. Uh, from the place, we have this picture. In red, the areas where agroforestry is not presented almost uh, significantly presented at all with less than uh, 0.1%. So it's most of Europe, you can see gray, uh, reds. The left one is about grasslands, the right one is about arable crops. So less than 10% of the grasslands has uh, agroforestry and less than 1.1% of the grasslands have arable crops. So there is a huge potential. With regard to people, well, I just want to mention that there was a European Union project that created an agroforestry innovation network. It has 2 million euros and created a network with more than 1,500 1, actors, which also gave us why uh, the, the main challenge is why agroforestry is not implemented across Europe. They can be divided in technical, economical, educational and policy aspects. With regard to technical, they say that we, the technicians and the, and the researchers should provide more information about how to mix the goody perennials with the grass. When uh, should these mixers uh, be, be established? Because we have to take into account the tree age and the shade and where. So taking into account the local adaptation, more research is needed to, to move this forward. Also, from an economic point of view, they want to ask. They asked us about alternative evaluations of organic and conventional agroforestry systems, so in both type of land uses, and the development of bioeconomy with new products, with labeling, with new market types, with the creation and development of a business environment, uh, an ecosystem, a business ecosystem that develops infrastructures that make this agroforestry movement or transition more easier. So innovation development through the creation of business plans, infrastructure, co cooperatives development is, 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 are needed from the farmer point of view. Also education, but not only education uh, through ACIS or through, through extension services. 
also education to the, to the consumers, which is key to move agroforestry across Europe. With regard, this information could be uh, seen, uh, um, a lot of uh, technician information and, and also policy and, uh, and bioeconomy information could be seen in the knowledge cloud that was created uh, in, uh, by the European, uh, by the, the Affinet project, and also in the live handbook where you find easy to read information about agroforestry created by uh, by all uh, the stakeholders participating in the in the Affinet project. It's also I, I, I can say that it includes also a forward uh, uh, yeah uh, information and 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 documents. And it's, uh, it's available in different languages to better reach farmers. So please contribute because you are still uh, able to contribute to our a life handbook. From a policy point of view, well, we made an analysis. The strengths we saw are the income, better income, better environment, better social uh, welfare. Weaknesses is our complexity, knowledge infrastructure, lack of infrastructure and knowledge, opportunities, eco-intensification, mitigation, adaptation, and enhancement of biodiversity, which is key for the mitigation and adaptation aspects, and threats, lack of market, extension services, appropriate infrastructures and policies. And this should be the start of the start point for the strategic plans that has to be provided by the member states in, 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 in Europe. Well, and finally, in Affinet, we made some comments. I will leave them because this uh, this um, information will be this uh, presentations will be available for all of you. I will uh, I will we will leave it for you, but I will just make a summer a summary as a premise. We have to say that agroforestry should be strongly supported by the CAP because. Sustainable land management option, delivering market and non-market uh, goods and services that addresses what United Nations Global Society goals. Governments need to develop policies and actions that foster agroforestry within the an EU policy framework. And the main policy recommendations coming from the floor from the people in Affinet were the following: a clear definition of agroforestry, a clear recognition of the practices, silvopastures, silvoarable, hedgerows, forest farming, home garden, et cetera. The, the, the allocation of these uh, types of practices to agriculture, forestry, and urban areas, the enhancement and promotion of landscape features as a type of agroforestry, the recognition of agroforestry in the CAP through uh, an adequate management plan pro provided by farmers, ensuring that arable, plan, arable lands and grasslands that use agroforestry are fully eligible. There were strong problems in the past with this. Agroforestry promotion, should, the agroforestry should be promoted in permanent crops because there we don't have any kind of eligibility problem, but uh, people is not using them. As such, part of the eco schemes, this we have to say that we from Affinet, Ura, Fact Forward, from the different projects that have come from um, the, the payments of the European Union, we were able to include agroforest in the, in the eco schemes. For Pillar 2, which are co funded by the European Union uh, funds, with, together with the, with the member states, we also asked for clear practices in the identification. If funds are provided in Pillar 2 to develop agroforest and agricultural systems to ensure that they are fully eligible for Pillar 1, for forest land, ensuring that establishment and, by, and, mine, and maintenance and management improvement are part of the of the aids, aids that are given to the to the farmers, promote of course farm co cooperation, value chain cooperation, and of course training through toward, through the better uh, acquis uh, development. And um, thank you uh, very much for uh, hearing uh, me. Uh, as I mentioned, the whole set of recommendations will come afterwards, but I will not, I will stop here in order to give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you, thank you very much. And questions will be uh, carried out at the end. So take good note for my questions. I will appreciate, uh, I will really uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate them. Sorry. So, uh, let's move on. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Anastasia Pantera. Uh, 
uh, she will talk about silvopastoralism and biodiversity uh, preservation. Uh, Anastasia Pantera is a full professor of the University of Athens. Uh, she's also leading the uh, agroforestry network of, on, uh, on Greece, has many, many uh, papers and participated in many European Union uh, projects. Uh, Anastasia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Rosa. I'm just trying to um, open up my presentation. I'm very happy to be with you today, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it is a great uh, initiative, and I hope I will contribute. I, uh, I am I'm going to try to keep my time because I was I'm I'm always accused of talking too much, and uh, so I'm just gonna try to be as short as possible and give space to my students or the other participants and the other participants to ask for questions and maybe start the conversation afterwards. So uh, while the system uploads the, my presentation, I would just like to mention that um, silvopastoralism, the, the basic idea actually is that silvopastoralism is by diversity for me. And not for me, I mean, it, it, has, been, it has been proven. Uh, Silvopastoralism is uh, a traditional actually land use system that has been uh, practiced since anciently. And, uh, in, and yeah, that's, this is even more uh, evident in here in Greece, where um, we have a long history of uh, pastoralism and uh, use of the natural environment. Um, okay, I'm sorry, still it's trying to upload the presentation, which is quite big because I thought it would be nice if I give you a tour around Greece and around the civil pastoral systems, but it's taking a lot of time. So, um, that uh, civil pastoral systems are all very much important even at the present days because of all this, uh, because of the, the, the so uh, the point is that uh, it, it is quite getting more interest lately due to the climate change. And uh, also, as you said, actually, uh, uh, following your, your presentation, uh, Rosa, I think it was, it is so true. I mean, it, it, you will see that also my presentation has many things in common because there's so, there so much common base in agroforestry and uh, civil pastoral systems. So, okay. So you can see my presentation right now. Civil pastoralism is the oldest agroforestry system. Uh, there, are, there is actually evidence that um, um, in Greece, since Greece has been forested since before the Pliocene era. era uh, so, and by the time that people and humans started their um, their uh, activities it is it is really one of the first and it's quite known that uh, humans first were um, uh, pasture um, were um, were actually raising livestock they were livestock breeders and then they were farmers so it is actually one of the of the oldest um, uh, land use uh, in uh, recorded so this also had uh, uh, resulted to a problem of overgrazing. Uh, for example, I'm going to emphasize in Greece. In Greece was quite famous for the, it was even actually recorded in uh, many books and in the history, historic books of the, and uh, mentioning of the uh, ancienty that, uh, for example, in Crete, um, as they were saying, the, the goats of the Cretan people ate their forest. Uh, but of course, we have to realize also that it's quite, uh, it makes quite sense because if you have all these activities, human activities, of course, people had to be fed. So, uh, of course, uh, people had to use, um, to use something to, to, to eat. So this is what uh, actually, uh, so livestock was providing food. So grazing was mentioned in many ancient books, as I said, also in Homer. And also it was a very nice uh, description of the gardens of Ulysses, where he, his uh, livestock uh, breeder, he was raising his uh, hogs. 
So silvopastoral systems uh, are, as I said, by diverse by diverse by themselves because trees can be any type of uh, and, and actually trees can be forester or forest trees or can be agricultural ones. They can be natural or planted and they can be evergreen or broad leaves. And of course, there is a variety of livestock. I'm mentioning this. Uh, I'm, I'm actually mentioning this because there is a big of criticism about silvopastoral systems of, uh, you know, what is used, where and that. Yeah, I, I should emphasize, actually, that the agroforestry, of course, silvopastoralism and agroforestry is a combination of land uses. It's not competing any other life, life or any other type of land use. So in Greece, it's, as I said, actually, it, this picture could be Greece, could be Spain, could be Morocco, could be uh, Italy, could be Turkey, could be anything. Uh, silvopastoralism, it is one of the most popular and actually it is, uh, it is found in uh, many flats, many mountainous or mountainous areas. And I'm, what I'm, my point I'm trying to say is that um, it, uh, take into account that biodiverse, the Mediterranean area, it's quite that biodiverse, it's quite popular, popular for its biodiversity. So you cannot really blame uh, pastoralism, as many people say, for affecting bi uh, biodiversity. So, uh, for example, in the, the, one of the popular uh, bi uh, silver pastoral, silver pastoral uh, types are uh, in gardens where you have the animals that they're coming usually after the completion of the uh, growth cycle and they clean up the land. So also they provide many um, services like the life uh, fences for direct or direct grazing. They protect the soil, they act as windbreaks and they uh, can be used as a natural uh, property boundary. And of course they are evidence that they are a, a refugee for other species. And uh, don't forget that also, not only as I said in Greece, but in all the Mediterranean countries, uh, one of the most popular and the more uh, quality honey produced is usually in the silvopastoral systems. So what I'm saying is that these are all evidence that actually silvopastoral systems do enhance biodiversity and they do not compete with it. So again, for example, you mentioned uh, Dr. Mosquera that uh, you, we have this transhuman type of uh, the movement of, uh, of animals in, uh, during the winter for, and, the, and the spring. And uh, we have uh, evidence, there have been evidence that actually animals as they move, or at least in the past, when they were moving from area to the area, to the, to, from one area to the other, they were actually dispersing seeds from one location in the, uh, to the other. So that means what? They are actually enhancing biodiversity. So this is why we have so many different plant species in uh, the different locations. So anyway, um, I know that there was a PhD um, work that the person, um, the, the student have found that during the course of these animals, there was a lush actually by diversity, plant by diversity, I should say, of different species that the, the animals were carrying from the one location to the other. And of course, the presence of animals provide a whole bunch of other services like shading, nitrogen fixation, and uh, as you also said, flammable biomass control. So why, why is this related to biodiversity? Because through actually this biomass, this fire uh, control, they do uh, preserve the biodiversity because take into account that one of the worst cases and, and the worst uh, scenarios that happens in the destruction of the biodiversity is after forest fires. So actually livestock and silvopastoral systems uh, uh, enhance biodiversity directly in the means that I have said, but also indirectly by, by protecting the forest fires. So actually, uh, in another study, they have tried of where are the most uh, percentage of edible and pharmaceutical plants. And as you can see here, in the open forest, which these open forests actually are the superpastoral systems, there is a large, the higher, a higher percentage of edible and pharmaceutical plants. So um, this is another proof that actually superpastoral systems enhance biodiversity. 
for example, another example here is a very uh, here here is a forest uh, pine forest from Greece. So you can see that this being grazed, so there is no understory. If these are the more fl flammable uh, ecosystems in uh, I think in Mediterranean systems and not only in Greece. So if it wasn't for the for the pastoralism and if it wasn't for the grazing. Uh, there would have been a, a, a lush at the story, a flammable at the story that would distract, uh, would uh, destroy actually this uh, system. And see here, you can see another. You can see that the understory is quite clear. There isn't so much uh, understory, so it's protected. The same with Pinus brutia. Um, here is another picture. Of, you know that this is a traditional pastoral system of Greece, so it was used for many different. Um, I'm finishing. Uh, it's been used for many different, provides a, a, an, an enormous amount of products such as uh, resin and of course, livestock. Other popular um, um, uh, silvopastoral systems in Greece are the chestnut ones. I know that they are also in Spain. And uh, also we have done some uh, studies and we have seen that they are very, and they're very, very lush in, uh, in plant diversity. We have a whole bunch of uh, different uh, plant species that they've been used. Also, this is another uh, uh, picture from the Kea island of Greece. And here you can see it's also Valonia oxalopastoral systems. They're being used with, a, with a specific uh, type of bovine. And uh, we have uh, also have done some uh, uh, inventories and we have seen that they provide, beside the multiple products, also they support a whole bunch of uh, different plant species. And here you can see, and I would say all, not only by diversity, but also you can see this beautiful landscape. I think the, the, the landscapes that they have been created by these systems are unique and uh, diverse. And of course, this is a picture from Spain and another picture from Spain. So you can see this, this, this multiple dimensional and multiple uh, ecosystem services systems that they are, that they are the civil pastoral systems. So to conclude, uh, they all the master systems that we have at least we have uh, um, inventoried, we have found that they support the lush and biodiversity. They are viable, and one of the main threats that they actually face presently is abandonment. Uh, so at this, if I can actually suggest some, uh, make some suggestions, I would say that we really need to involve the farmers, and we need really need to do that. We need to provide motives, but also examples, living examples. And I think I hear quite a lot lately about the living labs. So I think these living labs, it's it's a very uh, it's a very positive step towards the preservation of the superstructural systems. So just to give you an example, we have some soil, soil, soil uh, moisture detectors in, in, in a civil pastoral system. So here you can see the different soil moisture into different systems. The one is, is, is outside the, uh, this, this uh, detector is outside the crown, uh, the civil pastoral system, and this one is within a, a civil pastoral system. So you can see also different, this is 20% soil moisture and this is 6%. So it's exactly the same time period. So you can see the one of the many uh, uh, pr positive effects of uh, silopastoral system. This is actually a picture of um, our experimental plots. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm ready to any questions or discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia. We are a bit running of, out of time, so let's move on directly to our net, next speaker, who is Nuria Ferreiro, Forest Grazing, a, a way to mitigate climate change. Nuria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation to be part of uh, this event uh, organized under, under the framework of the European Green Week, and congratulations for the organization of, of, the, of the event. So the title of my presentation is uh, for grazing uh, a way to mitigate climate change. Well, uh, as you know, uh, during the, the last uh, years, different organizations are saying that we have to consume a, a lower amount of, of meat to combat the, the climate change because meat and dairy sectors are responsible for around 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions mainly to the liberation of methane from livestock during the digestive process, the conversion of land for animal feed uh, that implies in some cases forest fires and, and tree clearing, 
the use of nitrogen fertilizers on the farms to increase the, the plant production and the emissions from meat transportation. But uh, we have to take into account that the population is growing, uh, so we need food for the population, for the people, and, and we need protein from, from meat. And from, for these reasons, uh, we need sustainable uh, land systems uh, to combat the climate change. And in this context, we have the, the silvopasto. Sorry, but now I cannot pass my the slides of my presentation. I know I don't know if you are seeing the previous uh, slide or no. Uh, as uh, Rosa mentioned in, in her presentation, uh, the silvopastoral systems can be defined as um, a, a combination of woody vegetation with forest and animal production on, on the same land. Uh, this type of agroforestry practice can be implemented in the in the forest system, and, and, and agroforestry systems and silvopastoral systems are recognized by several organizations uh, around the world as a tool of adaptation and, and mitigation of climate change. Uh, mainly, as you can see in, in this slide, in, in, in the figure on, on left, uh, in the silvopastoral system. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, agroforestry systems are recognized by several uh, organizations around the world as a strategy of adaptation and mitigation to climate change. Uh, mainly, as you can see in this uh, figure, in, in, in on left of this slide, uh, because in the case of the silvopastoral systems, uh, the greenhouse uh, emissions from animals can compensate by the carbon uh, accumulated in the woody component of the system, but uh, also in the in the soil that is the most important uh, pool of, of carbon in the terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, moreover, in the, in the silvopastoral systems, as mentioned, uh, Rosa, uh, the grazing with animals can uh, control uh, the biomass in the understory, can reduce this biomass in the, the understory. And this is very important uh, from a point of uh, view of fire risk in, in areas of the South uh, Europe in which the, the, the fire risk is very, very high. And we have to take into account that the, the fires imply uh, important green, greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere, which is related with the climate change. This slide, please. Now I will try to explain uh, some results obtained in, in projects carried out in the Agroforestry Research Group of the University of Santiago de Compostela, in, in where I am a uh, postdoctoral research. And in these projects, uh, silvopastoral systems were uh, evaluated from a point of view of mitigation to climate change. Uh, in this slide, you can see results obtained in a, in a project in, in which uh, Celtic peas uh, were established in, in a forest area in, two, in 2018. And one year after the establishment of the experiment, we observed an important increase of the, of the carbon in the soil, of the soil organic of, of the carbon. Uh, this result would, could be explained with, by the addition of organic, organic matter to the soil from animal excreta and also to the effect of the urine uh, on the incorporation of the organic matter of, uh, to, the, to the soil. Can you pa continue with the presentation, Javier, please? Uh, moreover, in this, uh, in this project, uh, also we observed that, uh, that due, due to the effect of the grazing of the animals, the percentage of uh, rats in the, in the, in the, in the story decreased over time. However, the percentage of herbaceous species as grasses in, in, increased uh, over time. And this is uh, very important uh, from a point of view also from, of uh, fire risk, uh, because as you know, the, the herbaceous species are uh, less farmable uh, compared with the, with the shrubs of the, of the understory. Uh, this is very relevant for Galicia, where the, the study was established, because uh, you, uh, we have to take into account that Galicia is one of the most Five areas of, of Europe. Next slide, Javier, please. And in this slide, you can see also uh, results of a, of a project carried out in the agroforestry research group of the University of Santiago de Compostela. Uh, this, uh, this work was funded by the uh, Galician government. Uh, the name of the project is uh, Aforagro. Um, this uh, project was funded to evaluate different land uses in Galicia from a point of view of, uh, of mitigation to, to climate change. 
In this slide, you can see results obtained in forest areas I established with uh, pine radiata and with different uh, canopy covers. And uh, as you can see in the slide, a uh, race in favor the, the sequestration of, of carbon in the in the soil. You can see in the slide some, some pictures of the of the forest area with the animals uh, and the pastory and in the understory. Uh, can you continue, Javier, with the presentation, please? Uh, in this project, uh, was also observed that uh, uh, grazing implies carbon linkage to the smaller soil, soil particles. Um, this carbon is very stable. This carbon is retained in, in the soil in the long term. So this is, is uh, important uh, uh, from a point of view of, of mitigation because this carbon is maintained in the soil and is not uh, no, is not uh, moved from the soil uh, with uh, different uh, activities as uh, tillage or, or fertilization. Next slide, please. And the positive effect of uh, grazing uh, on the accumulation of carbon on the small uh, particles of the soil was also observed in, in this other study and also established in, in forest area with uh, grazing. In this, in this case, with uh, sheep, with different stocking rates of sheep. Um, the results were uh, published in, in a journal with high impact. Um, these results were uh, also implemented in forest companies of, of, of Spain. So investigation in this case uh, was put on, on practice. So this is uh, important for, for, uh, for all of us uh, as researchers. Javier, please. So the conclusion of this presentation is silvopastoral system should be promoted around Europe a sustainable land use for a mitigation to climate change. Thank you very much for, for the, your attention. I'm sorry for this problem with my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nuria. Since uh, Professor Marina Castro is uploading her presentation, I will make a presentation of, 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 of her. I think we have it already. Thank you, Marina. Um, well, Professor Marina Castro is, uh, is professor uh, in the ATB in uh, IPB, sorry, in the in, in, in the north of Portugal, and is leading an operational group funded by the European uh, Union, the European Network for Rural uh, Development, about uh, agroforestry. So, Marina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning. I would like to thank Rosa for this invitation. I'm very pleased to join the Green Week initiative of the University of Santiago de Compostela. Now I'll share uh, the Portuguese experience of operational group Private uh, Forest in Portuguese Matas Privadas. Uh, I don't know the 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 screen. The screen uh, don't uh, go to the two slide. Hello. Yes, it is not. Uh, yeah. There is no not the I have the control. to the second one. I have the control. Yeah, yeah, you have it. Uh, I don't know what. Uh, Maybe uh, if you. To share again your 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 PowerPoint. Ah, oh, no, yes. no, okay. no, okay. now it's working. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. That's so uh, uh, the goals are a forestation of agricultural land with more civil culture, uh, more grazing and more innovation and value. So uh, the context, uh, this uh, initiative shares a way to give more value to the private forest. Why? Uh, currently, they face various problems. Uh, they have no economic profitability that could remunerate the civic cultural uh, operations. So, our operational group bring together uh, life um, farmers, uh, uh, forest producers, uh, livestock breeders and uh, their associations. Uh, and um, it builds a network for uh, discussion, uh, for uh, try uh, solutions for uh, this problem. So, 
uh, aims to develop a multifuncional model for forest management by uh, creating an online platform that allows technical decision support, improving the economic management of producers. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, there are a small scattered property areas in the north and center of the country. Uh, there were a forested under the special programs for agricultural lands. This program uh, represents more than a half of the forest investment financed by the European Union in the last 30 years to about 220,000 hectares. Today, there is a lack of technical guidance to exploit the potential and value of the forest. The end of heads for the maintenance of forest leads to the absence of, of forestry management. Wildfire is the most determining factor in the loss of forest value, reducing goods and services provided. So, the idea is to try to increase economic profitability of these areas by more forestry management and better management, silvopasture use and innovation and value from products associated with the forest, uh, add more value to the wood per se and by reduce clearing costs and also uh, the remuneration of ecosystem service. What is our uh, main problem in Portugal? The Portuguese forest have a high probability of burning. Forest burns several years over 100,000 hectares, uh, about 1.2% of surface area of the country. Now we are focused on uh, silvopasture. Uh, grazing helps decrease fuel load accumulation. Shepherds and forests don't speak the same language, so the establishment of silvopastoral systems is sometimes very hard. In this picture, a huge accumulation of fuel loads on chestnut uh, stands. Uh, here, um, uh, the same problem uh, in American Hawk, Quercus rubra, and uh, in this Cork Hawk forest, uh, uh, we have already started the grazing process after great difficulty to find a find uh, uh, find a flock to to graze this area. So, uh, ongoing initiatives. We are developing demonstration actions, field days, focus on the idea of more civicultural measures, better wood and better income. And uh, silvopastoralism, uh, it's possible and desirable. So, uh, um, a picture of uh, our uh, demonstration area with the uh, Cork uh, Oak Forest, and uh, in this picture, uh, it is shown the usefulness of the practical knowledge, um, the use of concentrate feeds, increase the appetite of animals prov and provide nutrients, compensating grazing on low quality hoods. So is a, a knowledge practical, very useful uh, for uh, our researchers. So, um, in summary, uh, what we want is to transform forest system into agroforestry to reduce fire risk, reduce clearing costs, improving hood and other values, uh, production of other gods and pay ecosystem services. And finally, uh, we intend to demonstrate to one and others uh, foresters and livestock keepers that silvopastoral uses are more profitable than the forests we have 
nowadays. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to clarify some questions if I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marina, for your presentation. Yeah, I think that is key, not only for the north of Portugal, but also for the for Galicia, for the area where we are, because we are suffering a lot of uh, even lives from uh, from yeah from from forest fires. So our next next presenter is Professor Alexander Wessel. He works in Sara, and uh, uh, his presentation would be agroecology, agroforestry, and their living labs promotion. And I also have to say that he's the current coordination of agroecology for Europe, a uh, European Union project, where that would be the basis of the, agro the future agroecology uh, partnership across Europe. Uh, Alexander, the, the work, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Rosa. Do you see my PowerPoint already? Yeah. Okay, we good. see it perfectly. I, yeah. I will try to do it in four minutes because I, I, I know there's one speaker behind. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, but so the technical yes, um, problems appeared anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah. no. So, okay. well, um, I will speak about agroecology. Well, an agroforestry is part of agroecology, of course, either as a practice or as a, as a system. And um, today, a little bit more specifically also about the promotion of living labs. So agroecology is, let's say, on a momentum at the moment, a little bit on promotion or in Europe. Um, even if it exists since 90 years already, starting in the 1930s with the first publication, which is oft, often not very known. I will speak a little bit about um, moan, uh, some points from the Agroecology for Europe project, but then give a small outlook at the end on, on, on the policy thing. So something which is we are still missing is uh, to know much more about agroecology. While agroecological initiatives, um, that includes also agroforestry, of course, different types of living labs, research infrastructures, NGOs, farmers groups all over Europe. Um, in some countries, we have a, a certain knowledge, but not for all countries in Europe. And this is currently underway. So we hope that at the end of the year, there will be a large mapping available from about all things in, on agroecology all over Europe. Then going to the living labs. So living labs are, are very important, of course, for agroecology because agroecology just takes place in a context specific and um, in participation of different types of stakeholders. Um, so it can be either at the farm level. Well, then you look um, also general, more generally in living labs at well skills and methods of, which are needed for the development uh, development of living labs, and then that we can learn from this from existing already living labs to use them as best practice and establish scenarios for large implementation. So either well, sometimes you'd say it's at the farm level or a cooperation of some farmers, but it can be also at the territory landscape level where the stakeholders are involved. Um, so not only farmers, but also stakeholders of the food system, policymakers can also be, um, where everything um, is done around uh, uh, trying to adapt more um, um, agroecological practices, but on the other side also conserve biodiversity and natural resources, as some of the examples have been shown by the speakers before for the examples for agroforestry. But go then also uh, into the food system and uh, have uh, the development in, of embedded, so territorialized uh, food systems. And um, to come out of this mapping and this uh, living lab thing, um, coming then finally to a uh, to a uh, European agroecology knowledge hub for better exchange. So this um, should be also established in the next few months. On the one side to share knowledge among different stakeholders, so farmers, farmers, farmers with others, um, and um, to provide a best practice platform. So at the end, a little bit like Rosa presented at the, uh, the beginning for the Affinet only, only, I mean, <laughs> it's not only, but uh, for agroforestry, also to have a, star, a stronger stakeholder connection and uh, fostering a network creation that there can be uh, interactive exchange via this platform. And yeah, if, if, if I spoke about the promotion of agroecology, so on, there is some more officially now since uh, well, the uh, new uh, the Green Deal and inside the Farm to Fork uh, strategy. Um, and on the right hand side, um, the biodiversity strategy, which mentions a little bit agroecology, but includes many elements of agroecology. 
And much more recently, um, while well, the list of the uh, proposed eco schemes, uh, which are proposed by the Euro uh, European Commission, and they are clearly inside, you will find a larger list of different agroecological practices and agroforestry. And as I said, um, this should end up all in a, in a European partnership on agroecology living labs and research infrastructures, which should see the light in 2023 if everything goes well and if all the member states also participate in, in funding it. And this will be to connect uh, and have a network of living labs all over Europe and research on it and uh, part, um, other events and actions to be carried out within this network. So I try to be very quick, um, so it should leave the time for the next speaker still, uh, still uh, as we are already out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alexander, for this. I think you made it perfectly and very clear for all of, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and being so fast. So uh, Philippe Grandman would be our next, next speaker. I invite him to upload his presentation since I, the moment by the moment I am I am I'm making his presentation professor uh, uh, Philip Grundman works at the ATB in the Living Institute of Agriculture Engineering and Bioeconomy is the the coordinator of uh, one of the most promising uh, grass based circular business models project which, which is called the uh, go go grass and he will explain us how bioeconomy can help in the his case in in the case of uh, of grasslands but can be expanded to any type of biomass that is uh, used in the, that is uh, that is produced in the in the land so uh, philip the, the the floor is yours Thank you, Rosa. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for having me here, even though um, my focus will be a little bit uh, different one because I'm not dealing that much with agroforestry system, but more with the grassland production systems. Nevertheless, the institute where I work for, the Leibniz Institute for Agriculture, Engineering, Bioeconomy, is known to be one of the leading institutes in, in Germany the field of uh, short rotation coppice and agroforestry. However, the topic of this presentation here now, the focus will be on um, business development, alternative businesses, which I think is of interest very much also for agroforestry developments. And um, what is the current situation uh, we are dealing with when we are talking about grasslands, which is the topic of the Go Grass project I'm uh, I have the pleasure to coordinate. And on, on this next slide, you Philip, uh, just... Uh, is it only me, but I cannot see anything? Okay, thanks for yeah, letting the, me know. The we problem, no, we can see it, uh, but the thing is that it's not moving. I'm not sure if you move it uh, into the second slide, uh, Philip. Yes, I, I did. So it's supposed to... Be we only see the first, uh, the first slide. Now, oh, now, now it did move it. Yes. Okay. Okay. You, okay. So um, most of you already know that uh, uh, most of the grassland in Europe is permanent grassland. The area itself is not increasing that much, but much of the grassland areas are not economically viable for fodder use. So it's important to find uh, other opportunities, other business opportunities, especially because the livestock which used to uh, graze this grassland is uh, there's a trend to decline the livestocks in in all over europe uh, the go grass project itself is looking at four business opportunities in uh, the northern part of europe you can see this uh, on the slide on the bottom there is about it's about organic uh, protein production about paper production from grass fibers uh, animal bedding materials and uh, biochar production uh, as a soil amendment. Well, the main goal of the project is, of course, to make these businesses successful, but also to uh, replicate them. And I think this is something that's uh, in common with the agroforestry, um, yeah, the agroforestry projects that you were presenting here, and. Um, our assumption is that to have this replication be successful, we need to better understand how the business requirements are, what the business requirements are, and how the business environments work. 
and the business environments themselves, uh, we decompose them in six uh, sub arenas, which you can see here in the circle on the left side of the slides. It's about funding, it's about the sub arena technology and knowledge, the sub arena of resources and infrastructure, institutional development, and um, market and customers development. Moving on to the next slide, I want to refer now to uh, work that uh, we did. It was led based by, by Rosa and her team. Within the GoGrass project, we surveyed um, altogether 15, uh, around 15 uh, businesses in Europe. Um, you can see it in the table now. You should be able to see in the table now the businesses are mainly in Northern European countries, but also in, in Spain and, and Italy. And what we can see initially is that um, the alternative grassland businesses are a very heterogeneous group of businesses. They are uh, the ones we surveyed at least are successful ones, are expanding ones. They are highly diversified, so they serve different uh, product groups ranging from feed or food, of course, but also up to bioplastics, papers, fertilizers, biofuels, and more. So usually these businesses, um, they produce more than just one product and the customer is frequently not the end customer, but the industry. What we did in the project was um, we analyzed those cases in terms of how the value chain looks like uh, and the business model uh, is uh, constructed. And then we uh, analyzed to see what benefits these businesses are providing to in terms of the sustainable development goals. At the end of this, we will be having an online interactive map and a guideline for users to look at those successful cases throughout Europe and to learn from them. Well, um, some results I would like to share with you here on the next slide about profiles, what characterizes these um, businesses. What we see in terms of uh, resources and infrastructure is that the businesses have um, a very high need of good uh, access to resources and infrastructure, most of them. Um, but we see that the environment itself not, does not always support this need. So um, there is a gap between the needs and the, uh, between the requirements and the, and the conditions. In terms of the funding, uh, we also find a gap, but it's not that pronounced. So the funding scheme of those businesses is quite diverse. But we see that about one third of uh, the businesses express that the environment is not very supportive. All others uh, were okay. Looking at the superena technology and knowledge, here we can see that the situation is much better. So the businesses actually uh, feel that they have access to sufficient technology and knowledge. But um, this is not the case when it comes to the transfer of the knowledge, the training and education. There seems to be quite a gap, as we can see in the lower part of the of the slide. So more than um, yeah, around one, a bit more than one fourth of the businesses said that the, their environment is not really very supportive. And last but not least, market structure and development. We see again some gaps. This is of course very important for uh, the businesses, um, but we see that there are some, some gaps and uh, the market structure is not always very supportive. The institutional development in general is considered to be more supportive, but with some gaps existing in some cases. Um, and, in the case of the consumer awareness, which is of course very, very relevant for new products and new businesses, which are not on the market yet, but need to be understood by consumers. We see again, a need for um, more supportiveness in the business environment. Coming to an end, of course, this is just a very quick overview only. Um, I would like to end my presentation with some um, uh, lessons learned and that's that those, we identified as a common pattern in, in, in this business is that the successful ones have a good alignment 
of action situations within and across the enterprises and the environments. So on we see the, on one side the business models, on the other side the business environments. They can be well aligned, but they need to be linked very well. And the crucial factors here, we believe, are related to capacity building. Capacity building uh, in, in the center, including a clear strategic development, good corporations, uh, a good understanding of the processes and uh, agreement on steering structures, but also constant learning and innovation. So thank you for your time, uh, having a quick look at this and please follow our journal in the Go Grass project. And I'm looking forward to, to the following panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, we are a bit uh, uh, out of time uh, right now, but I would give uh, the floor and and see some uh, if there are some questions in the um, in the in the chat uh, about uh, yeah these these questions. I can see Nuria is uh, rose her hand. Uh, Nuria, can you make a a, a question, please? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the for the for these excellent presentations. I have a, a small question for Anastasia. Uh, Anastasia, congratulations for your presentation. I think that it was very clear. Uh, during the, the presentation, uh, you said that agroforestry is a traditional system in, in Greece. Uh, what do you think about the implementation of new agroforestry systems? Do you know the, the farmer uh, opinion about this? Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Sosa Maria. And um, I would, uh, there is there is one peculiarity about Greece. In Greece, most of the forest area, the forested area, is public, is not private. So that means that there is this uh, um, relation of, if I may say, between the farmers, the livestock breeders, and the public and uh, the, the, the restrictions that are posed by law for the protection of the forest uh, land. So in most of it, there are only a few cases that actually um, there, there is private land that can be characterized as uh, superpastoral, very, very few actually. And uh, the farmers generally prefer to not apply superpastoralism actually, uh, as I said, it's a traditional system, but in, and I, as I also said, a very important contribution of the silver pastoral system in biodiversity is that by, as the, the, the sheep or the animals move to the other, they actually are um, bringing with their fur and their um, they're bringing some uh, uh, very uh, variety of seeds that they actually disperse in their path. So this is abandoned. So because the farmers prefer to move their animals with trucks rather than walking as it was the traditional way. So this is why I said we need actually to advertise this uh, type of land management. We need to support it. Because um, take into account in areas like here in Carpenisi, in Britannia, which is a mountainous area, there are not so uh, the, the the implementation the complement the complementary feed as the marina have shown is quite expensive. So uh, there isn't much uh, feed available during the winter, which is a very heavy winter. So farmers have to buy livestock breeders have to buy uh, additional feed. And this adds up the cost of their um, enterprise. So if we are actually, as I said, at the point, at the stage that we need to support this type of land management use. Otherwise, um, I see, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't want to say that I'm disappointed, but uh, I'm saying that we need to work on it. And, and take into account that, as I said also in another uh, presentation that I have done yesterday, that uh, it is really amazing here in Britannia, we are in a mountainous area and it's remote, but we have the full support of the local stakeholders, any type of stakeholders, ranging from policymakers to actually livestock breeders. Whereas in contrast, 
only 100 kilometers away, we have this very famous Valonia oxybopastoral system. It's it's a it's a unique oxybopastoral system in uh, the whole Balkan area, but we have exactly the opposite uh, attitude. Uh, from the local stakeholders. They don't want the system. They don't want us to be there. They don't want to support the, the this practice. In contrast, what they are looking for is actually to establish more olive groves because they think that it's less, less uh, demanding in uh, effort and it's more uh, actually uh, profitable rather than the pastoral grazing. But you need to take into account, this is what we're saying to all the people here, that the, it's not just the biodiversity, it's not everything, it's it's a full range of products. And for me, it's also we have to advertise this. For example, we have a PhD student who is starting now his PhD with us. And uh, what we will, would try to prove is the meat produced by the animals that they are grazing in these silvopastoral systems is of higher quality. And actually, we already have some proof of that. So if I can conclude my, my, my thoughts. Answer. Well, first of all, we need advertisement. Second of all, we need training and education. And third of all, we need to add value to the products of local systems. Oh, thank you very much. You made a very good summary of what we heard uh, now. Uh, I think uh, there is another question. Uh, Javier? Yes, thank you, Rosa. Uh, my question is for for um, for Philip. Uh, well, um, the alternative use of grassland we are working in is very interesting, but uh, well, I have been thinking about it uh, uh, well, last uh, weeks and so on. Um, how can we uh, use in a prof 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 with profitability, profitability uh, the the grass in the areas of the south of Europe uh, that do not produce uh, so much grass? And is there some way that uh, we could use? the grass from the roadsides and maybe from the gardens from institutions and the cities and so on in in the south of europe that we do not uh, have uh, so much grass as in in germany and and the north in and the north of europe thank you thank you for the question uh, javier of course there are many aspects that need to be taken into consideration uh, the quantity, but also the quality of the grass that, that's available matters a lot. Uh, and um, as um, <clears throat> assuming that there is a surplus of grass uh, that can be used for alternative products besides feed and food, which I think should always have a priority number one, but uh, assuming that there is a surplus, uh, the, we see some opportunities showing up uh, depending on the quality. Uh, I didn't have the time to explain, for example, uh, the opportunity to produce biochar as a fertilizer amendment um, out of very lignif lign lignified uh, grasses. Um, so th th that would be one, one way you mentioned road grass. Um, that is an option which is explored by our partners in, in the Netherlands to produce a grass uh, paper based, uh, a, gr a grass based paper. Um, well, that's possibly also an opportunity, and, 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 and there may be many more. But as, my, uh, as the speaker before me said, Professor Pantera, I think it, what matters a lot is that, that there is a um, an additional benefit provided besides the, the only the, the the product itself but that there is a, a benefit and that there are some beneficiaries who can support this uh, production system the benefit could be in terms of for example co2 um, sequestration or some kind of positive uh, ecosystem service effects things like that so there needs to be this added value i think to make the business model uh, um, a good story yeah 
and a profitable story. We still have one and a half years um, in the GoGrass to explore also options for replication in Spain. So uh, yes. please follow up our journey yeah. on that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you thank very you. much, uh, uh, Philip. Is there another question there? Uh, Nuria, I think she wants to make another question. Nuria? Yes, thank you, Rosa. I have a question for Marina. Uh, uh, Marina, uh, do you know if in Portugal uh, is there any type of network with all our agroforestry operational groups working together about agroforestry? Maybe a similar <laughs> initiative of uh, to Afinet. Um, I, I think um, in the north uh, there are uh, there are um, there aren't a lot of initiatives uh, from agroforestry. Uh, um, the only uh, operational group uh, about uh, agroforestry uh, this uh, the um, our group uh, in the south of Portugal. There are, uh, I think, there are uh, more initiatives uh, because um, the agroforestry uh, association in Portugal. Is not is not uh, yet uh, for uh, created, and uh, uh, there are, there are not there are not a lot of dissemi dissemination of agroforestry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other question? I just have a comment and a question, and I will end just because we are running really out of time uh, for Alexander. Uh, just having here all what we hear here by economy with uh, Philip, the potential of carbon sequestration, the potential of silvopastoral is mitigating climate change through the, the, the reduction of uh, forest fire risk. How do you see the role within the Agroecology for Europe project of the living labs and the connection with uh, agroforestry? Because for me, is, that is really, really relevant to engage all partners just to try to go to work in this a bit complex or more complex than the conventional simplistic uh, agricultural conventional systems. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, well, there is no specific focus on agroforestry within the Agroecology for Europe project, but I'm, I'm sure there will be some living labs which have some agroforestry practices or systems inside and um, then to connect them also because um, it's um, uh, alternatives which are not so many farmers are aware of. So it's still, let's say, relatively unknown while we have larger areas for the silvopastoral system. But um, within the more conventional system and, and the more intensive systems, I think there are a lot of pathways to enlarge to a certain degrees on agroforestry. And so there are the connection within the living depths and we see if you have farmers which connect to each other and see good examples from others, then I think also that could be a strong support for expanding um, agroforestry into larger areas. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking agroforestry into account and as part. I mean, there cannot be another way of agroecology for Europe uh, initiative. So I just because we are running out of time, thank you very much. I would like to Rosa, thank you all. Yeah. We have a suggestion or a question in the, from Basiliki Lapa in the chat. Ah, sorry, Maybe I didn't mention see it. it or can you or make it, it? Can you make the question because I'm not able to see yeah. it? Sorry. Yeah, or I can read. Uh, as there is interest in voluntary marketing of carbon dioxide by farmers, uh, could you mention some applied research practices measuring dioxide uh, storage in agroforestry systems? Uh, I guess that is for Nuria or for me. Nuria, you want to, to talk about this or shall I answer? Yes, you can ask me. Well, there are several uh, experimental uh, initiatives that uh, have demonstrated already as the figure that I show in my presentation uh, that agroforestry is able to sequester more carbon. Uh, people, I mean, usually um, the, the, the official way to include, the, uh, to include um, forest, let's say, forest, not agroforestry, in the, in the um, carbon market is through the use of uh, what is called uh, of offsetting uh, carbon projects. 
These offsetting carbon projects are usually based only in the aerial and, and, and root part of the tree that is grown in the in the forest. So the soil is not taken into account. And as you can so, see from Nuria, there are different ways of management that could enhance or reduce the amount of carbon that we have. So let's say that forest is seen as part of the land use, land change, uh, land use change a section for the IPCC, the Kyoto Protocol, and therefore for the carbon uh, market. But besides that, there are some initiatives that are taking place in some areas of, of Europe, but are, they are local initiatives that creates a kind of a local market. They are not uh, yet uh, recognized by the official, uh, uh, for the, by the ministries, but I think the, the way to move forward is that one, either to include also, but uh, it includes also the soil carbon storage, which is an important issue because they, they, the soil, as mentioned, it, uh, have the 85% of the carbon in, in the in the in the terrestrial ecosystems, but it's not officially included because there are problems with the measurements of of doing uh, of how to do it. We are just preparing a paper with the results with Nuri and me with about the results of uh, how carbon from soils can be included as part of the quantifying. Um, of quantification of carbon for the carbon market. If we move forward a bit from what is a land use uh, system, I, I can inform you that there are initiatives uh, that were recently presented within the Global Research Alliance framework with regard to uh, biochar. Biochar is one of the products that will be tested within the, the, the Go Grass project. And uh, I can tell you that in Japan, the ministry just uh, included the production of biochar of, as one of the activities that can be recognized as carbon, for, for carbon sequestration and therefore to, um, to be taken into account at global level and therefore to include them in markets. So let's say that there are initiatives, but it's not uh, yet uh, yeah, broadly established, just in a very punctual, uh, punctual way. But I have to say that with the biochar, for example, the, the Japanese people open a door for the woody perennials or for the herbaceous vegetation that is uh, that is produced within an agroforestry system. So I hope I have answered you. Yeah, I guess I guess so. Oh yes, he says thank you. Thank you to you. So I these presentations will be shared with all of you. We are recording the the, the meeting. And uh, yeah, just to end it uh, up, I just want to say that uh, agroforestry is a very key option for mitigate and adapt climate change, preserve biodiversity and enlarge the amount of ecosystem services that can be delivered uh, by our farms in uh, across Europe within the, uh, the umbrella of the agroecology uh, principles. Of course, especially, especially important are the forest fire prevention in the south of Europe, where most of biodiversity and ecosystem services are delivered because we don't have such a intensive farming systems that we can see in, 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 uh, in the north. And I, I'm looking really forward to see what is going on on an uh, agroecology for Europe project that will allow us to, to have a clear framework from a farmer point of view with these excellent living labs um, pathways that will be shown uh, for increasing the sustainability of farming systems in Europe. So thank you very much to all the audience for being here, for the patient with the technical issues and for being here a bit more than, uh, than, the, than it was programmed initially. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you. and all the attendants also. Thank you, Rosa. Thank, thank you. Thank you to all of you.